Hey everyone, and welcome to the next in our, our series of discussions on uh, the, the internet and technology and progress and some of the social issues that we face. Uh, we've done a number of these this year, focused on uh, topics ranging from regulation to journalism to uh, biomedical research. And today, we're going to focus on uh, a discussion around what progress is itself and how uh, we might study it and what, what uh, academic work is already going on in this space and um, what we, we might think about to look at examples from the past to uh, determine how we can make more progress for humanity going forward. So today joining me is uh, uh, Tyler Cowan, who is in studies economics at George Mason University and is also the uh, co-author of the popular blog, uh, Marginal Revolution, uh, and uh, Patrick Collison, who's the co-founder and CEO of Stripe, uh, which is a pretty amazing company that does uh, that basically does payments and economic infrastructure for the internet. So, you know, we've been talking about these topics for for a while now. Um, I mean, this is something that that you guys have both studied um, in a lot of depth. And um, you know, you recently wrote uh, an op-ed together. Uh, I think it was in the Atlantic um, about uh, how we might have a, a new or different approach for studying the nature of progress and uh, in, in order to kind of mine historical examples to figure out how we can we can make more progress in the future. So I think it would probably be interesting just to start off by um, you know hearing how you're thinking about that and, and um, uh, the basic summary and what what feedback you've gotten on the, the piece that you wrote. Sure. Uh, so I think um one of the most important sort of facts uh, in the world and sort of the history of civili civilization to date uh, is that the rate of progress has not been constant, right? Uh, if you look at sort of what happened in the world, say, between, you know, zero and you know, uh, 1700, 1800, thereabouts, uh, the rate of progress by sort of any major metric uh, in terms of, you know, average income or uh, average life expectancy or infant mortality, you know, any of these measures, uh, it was either sort of constant or only very you know, improving at a very slow rate, right? And then something happened. Something changed around sort of 1700, 1750, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, uh, uh, so some sort of, you know, the, 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 sort of, uh, the advent of kind of, you know, something approximating modern science. Um, and uh, once that happened, so many things started to get better together, right? Uh, uh, again, you know, incomes improved, life expectancies increased. We started to discover really fundamental knowledge about the world. We started to invent really important new technologies. And these things have, you know, over the uh, last couple of centuries really diffused around the world, right? Um, so that's, you know, very interesting and important. And, you know, the, the, the in intuition, I think, and the, the, the thing that sort of really struck um, uh, or you know, has been sort of a focus of both of ours uh, for the past couple of years is thinking about, well, um, you know, we, we sort of transitioned from this regime where we weren't making much progress to one where we you know, have been making much more. Uh, is, is, is this the best we can do, right? Uh, or you know, is there something that looks, you know, compared to the status quo today, you know, so much better again that it, it, it's sort of like the status quo ex ante, you know, before uh, the Industrial Revolution? Um, and uh, you know, as, as you look around the world today, uh, you know, on the one hand, we see the tremendous importance of the progress that we are generating, right? And that, you know, for example, uh, the number of people in you know, extreme poverty has declined by you know, more than a billion people since I was born. But on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of suggestive evidence that maybe we aren't as effective um, at generating progress today uh, as, uh, as we have been in the past. And so, you know, for example, if you look at the US, uh, sort of productivity growth uh, mid-century, or say between you know 1920 1970, was maybe about sort of 1.9% a year. Now most economists think it's much lower. You know, maybe around sort of you know 0.4% a year or something like that. So we're we're at least by economic measures generating progress more slowly than we used to be. Now, whatever the rate at which we're kind of making progress or or, or sort of you know uh, figuring out ways to do things better today, whatever that absolute level is. It would be much better if we were, you know, doing it more effectively. Uh, if we were able to solve the most important problems that face us today, um, uh, you know, uh, um, in 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 you know, 50 years and 100 years, rather than 500 years or 1,000 years, right? And so the meta question that you know we're really interested in is how how does progress happen? How do we discover useful knowledge? How is that diffused? And how can we do it better? It's yeah, important so to understand, I think, how much this is an invisible crisis. So if you have a growth rate that is one percentage point lower. Over the course of a bit more than a century, uh, you could have been three times richer with the higher growth rate. That would be something like the difference between um, the United States today and Mexico. So by having a lower rate of productivity growth, in no given year does it feel that bad. 
but two, three generations later, you're much worse off. It's harder to pay off your debts, harder to solve climate change, harder to address a whole host of problems. Yeah. So what do you, before we, we kind of dive into you know, how we could improve this, um, you know, what do you say to the, the people who question um, whether all this progress is, is positive? I mean, certainly as we make progress in one area, it creates issues in other areas. I mean, that's been a big topic that you know, I've focused on in, in my work at Facebook over the last few years um, and a lot of these challenge discussions. But how, do, how does that fit into the overall framework of, of uh, what you're studying in, 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 um, in, in this discipline here? You know, I don't think economic growth is always a positive. But the world in America has serious problems. I would rather address those problems with more resources rather than fewer, whether it is paying off our debts, addressing climate change, fixing global poverty. And knowledge matters too. So there's a recent paper by Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, and they find if you give foreign aid combined with coaching, the rate of return to that intervention is maybe 100 to 400 percent. Now that, that may or may not be true, but what I would like to see is a world where everyone is obsessing over that claim, over that debate, working very hard to figure out that it's true. That should be on the front page. People should be talking about it, you know, calling up their siblings. My goodness, I just read this. What are we going to do? Do you agree or not? Yeah, and, and look, while again, I think it's sort of unequivocally the case that sort of certain kinds of progress in certain places or, you know, to a certain extent, you know, can have harms and externalities and all the rest. And, uh, you know, a really important part of progress is figuring out how do we mitigate those? How do we solve them and so on? And, you know, I think climate change is probably the kind of the foremost global example today. But I think it's really important I mean, or it is easy for sort of us sitting here in the Bay Area in California, I think, to undervalue uh, the prosperity and the, the kind of uh, uh, wealth that we've been able to generate over the past couple, you know, again, uh, 100 years. Uh, and so, you know, s since I was born, for example, global life expectancy has increased by about six years. Um, infant mortality has fallen by more than 50 percent. Uh, uh, again, I, I mentioned the statistic about you know, the number of people who uh, uh, have left extreme poverty. Th this is incredibly important, right? And so I think uh, you know, there, there's a, you know, we're not the first people to say it, but there is a moral imperative to this kind of progress, uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that fact. Yeah, I agree. I, I, just, I think it's important. Um, you know, a lot of these things are not uniform, and I mean, you know, from running a company that you know, when you look at averages and anything, it hides a lot of issues. I mean, your, your example on um, the rates of poverty going down, I think, is an interesting one in this because, you know, what a lot of people don't particularly want to talk about these days is that most of the uh, benefit of, of people coming out of poverty has happened in China and a lot of other places around the world, some, in some places, poverty has actually increased. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I generally agree with the premise of, 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 of and, and I think studying this stuff will will generally help us to make more progress in those places. I mean, that may be a good example because perhaps looking at some of the examples of what has done well in China could be applied to other places where, um, where there have been issues. Um, but before we dive into the discussion on this, I, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't um, you know, cover this in a way that, that comes across as if like every step forward it comes without a cost. Um, and I'm sure as we talk through the different, the, the different examples, I mean, that'll, that'll come up as well. Yeah, well, and, and we should emphasize that, uh, you know, when, when we sort of talk about the phenomenon of progress, you know, w w I think GDP or GDP per capita is, is a sort of um, pretty good first approximation measure of it, and it correlates strongly with many of the things I think we care about, uh, but they're, def they're definitely not the same thing. And I think uh, an important you know, question for anybody kind of, you know, interested in this area to think about is, well, how should we define progress, right? Um, and what are the you know better and worse kinds of it? And again, in GDP, we, we kind of have a, a you know a relatively effective metric we can use across countries. But you know th th there already is interesting work on what might better measures be, and I think that's you know really important to study. Well, let's say you want to improve the lot of people in West Virginia. One growth enhancing way of doing that is to make it easier to build, say in Washington D.C. in the Bay Area. Right now, to move from West Virginia, say to Menlo Park. It's extraordinarily expensive. You can't just pick up and show up here and hope to get a job washing dishes the way one might have done in America 50 years ago. So by having more building, more economic growth, also more GDP, it would increase more opportunity. So economic growth and opportunity, they do tend to be correlated. And sometimes the problem is we don't have enough growth, not that we have too much. Mm -hmm. and, and look, not to hammer this point too strongly, but you know, you did invite the, the, the two people who wrote the piece about progress here. Um, uh, yeah, and I wouldn't spend most of the time actually talking about that. I just wanted to make sure that we hit that up front. So, so what are you, um, when you're talking about, 
you know, there are a lot of people who already are studying this in different ways, right? There are historians, economists. Um, when you're thinking about what the field is, um, when you're talking about um, trying to create a new science of, of studying progress, what more do you think needs to get done, or what, what do you envision on that? I mean, I know you have um, a fund that you've put together, um, Emerging Ventures. Emerging Ventures, and, yes. And where you're, you're basically finding um, academics who, who are studying uh, examples of, of where there's um, uh, of progress in the past to, to start this field. But I mean, but what does this kind of add up to? Or how do you think, what form does this take over time? One view of mine is that not enough philanthropy is long-term oriented. In this regard, I've been influenced by your Chan Zuckerberg initiative. And also in philanthropy, there are too many choke points that can say no. So foundations become their own bureaucracies. They become very risk averse. So Emergent Ventures is a new kind of philanthropy. There's one layer of yes or no. People are encouraged to apply. If the payoff is 30, 40 years down the road, the attitude is great. Take a lot of chances. Uh, worry about getting some winners and some risk and not expecting the median project to be something that necessarily looks good when taken to a board. So that's one way that thinking in terms of progress helps us restructure at the micro level particular decisions we're making. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah. So, so um, uh, strongly agree that sort of there's a lot of really you know, important work already happening across you know, multiple disciplines that can, is relevant to these questions. And you know, part of what, like <laughs> the, the, uh, the idea of there being a new science of progress, uh, that's not sort of quite, you know, th th that was the headline you know, pl placed uh, on the article, but sort of not exactly what we were saying. Uh, uh, what we were arguing is that the work that's already happening should be receiving more attention, and there should be much more of it. And so just to give us sort of a couple of quick examples. Uh, so uh, you know, th th there's strongly suggestive evidence that we can teach, uh, teach management you know, practices such that people can you know, mm -hmm. run firms more effectively, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's you know, a couple of studies on this. There's a good one from some folks at Stanford. Uh, they did sort of a randomized trial in India. And th there's uh, a really neat one that came out, I think, uh, last year uh, from uh, uh, Michaela Giorcelli, uh, looking at uh, uh, firms in Italy and showing that like over 15 years uh, after, sort of, again, a management training program with sort of a, a na natural, sort of, so some natural randomization, that again, th those firms were employing more people, paying more wages, you know, being more successful. And another uh, randomized trial uh, in Mexico, uh, uh, conducted over the past couple of years, again, 600 firms, uh, ensuring that just teaching better management practices actually makes those companies much better off. If that's true, that's amazing low-hanging fruit, right? We should be investing much more in this yeah. area. We should be figuring out which kinds of management training work better and worse than others. Is this generalized to all countries? How can we actually implement and execute this in the world more broadly? So that's kind of one. Second is, uh, you know, if, if you take um, uh, uh, you know, Tyler mentioned this point about sort of uh, you know geographic mobility, right? Uh, when you think about sort of how do we grow GDP or how do we generate progress, you know, m maybe kind of housing policy is not kind of the first thing we're naturally drawn to thinking about. Um, however, if, if you look at the world in uh, say the, the USA in in, in 19, you know, uh, 1980, about uh, forty percent of people when they took a new job moved yeah. somewhere else, right? So, yeah. and, you know, th those things went together much more. If you look last year, about one in ten people moved when they took a new job, right? And so within the US, geographic yeah. mobility has declined. That is in large part because uh, uh, the, the costs of movement have, have enormously increased as housing costs have, have uh, uh, increased, especially in our most productive regions uh, over the past couple of decades. Now, if you look into that sort of more closely, again, there are sort of economists who've been studying the, the, these questions you know, quite closely over the past couple of years. Uh, th th these two guys, uh, Shea and Moretti, published a paper, um, uh, an updated version of a previous paper uh, this summer, claiming or kind of pr uh, putting forward a model showing that uh, uh, if, you, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the zoning restrictions that existed in the Bay Area and New York uh, uh, between uh, 1964 and 2009, uh, and you kind of imagine a counterfactual world where there was sort of much more supply elasticity in these places. We built way more homes uh, here in the Bay Area and in New York. And in, in that counterfactual world, uh, average U.S. income would be, in their model, $3,700 per person higher. Again, not just for people in those places, but across the country, right? That, that, that's a huge effect size. And so, again, we should be studying these questions much more closely, and we should be figuring out, okay, well, you know, if that's true, what are the, what are the policy prescriptions? You know, how do we actually go act upon that? It's amazing uh, low-hanging fruit. And then just to, to give a third one, you know, I mean, uh, as those two examples show, funding science is incredibly important, um, but there's surprisingly little work about how we should be funding science and how can we do that most effectively. And Actually, sort of beneath the surface, uh, it's been changing a tremendous amount, uh, you know, here in the U.S. over the past couple of decades. 
Uh, and you know, th there are important you know, policy questions. Is, is that a good thing? And so, for example, uh, in 1980, uh, 12x more dollars, uh, uh, when, uh, or the NIH spent tw 12x more dollars on researchers under 40 than researchers over 50. So you know, they, they predominantly funded younger people. Um, uh, you know, today, they spend 5x more dollars on people over 50 than under 40. And so it's really inverted. It's kind of gone from you know, primarily funding the, the, these young investigators to this kind of gerontocracy where they're, they're, you know, they're, they're funding older scientists. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. You know, I don't know. But that seems like a very important question to answer. And so you know, part of our point in arguing for progress studies is when you really look at the, kind of the expansive version of this, of all the different things that can sort of, uh, 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 you know, influence our ability to discover new useful knowledge, to, to, to generate economic growth, that the, the set of questions is super broad, and we should be trying to kind of synthesize this effectively. Yeah. So let's go deep on medical research here for a second, because I think this is an area that um, you, know, you, you wrote this paper about before, about how the progress of, of, in the field might be slowing. And, and like you mentioned, I mean, the, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the, the philanthropy that um, I, I run with my wife, I mean, a big focus of it is on medical research and, and trying to, you know, we have this aspirational goal that we want to help build tools that can help scientists cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of this century. And basically, the math of how you get there is, you know, starting about 100 years ago, call it, um, you know, there was really this uptick in, in, in um, medical research where, you know, we started doing randomized control experiments, treating it more like an experimental science. Um, since around that time, the average life expectancy has increased by a quarter of a year every year, um, relatively linearly. Um, it's, there's no guarantee, of course, that that continues. But um, if we're able to have that continue, then that would imply that by the end of the century, we will generally have had to have either cure, prevent, or, or be able to manage most, um, if not all, of the diseases that, um, that, that we're aware of now. So there's, there's some trend that suggests that this should be reasonable. And the approach that we're taking in the work at CZI um, is largely about building tools to help compound the rate of, of, um, of science. So you know, what we see is that, um, you know, like you mentioned, the, the government is, is the largest and most important funder of science. And you know, it, it basically funds the, the whole establishment of, of um, scientists across the, the country. Um, but the grants tend to be very, um, very spread out uh, uh, across a lot of people. Um, they're not typically put into kind of big infrastructure projects, and that's the niche that we felt through CZI that we can maybe help um, to fill is you know investing instead of you know a, a million dollars in, in a lab, um, put a hundred million dollars or a couple hundred million dollars over time into building up really important um, scientific assets for the community, like helping to to, to fund um, scientists to go put together this human cell atlas, almost like the um, and kind of think about it as it's almost like the periodic table of elements, but for biology of all the different kinds of cells in, um, in the human body. Um, and, and the goal is just, you know, if, if you look throughout the history of science at least, um, you know, most major scientific breakthroughs have been preceded by the invention of new tools that help people look at things in different ways. And so the theory is kind of similar to what you're going at of how do you increase the compounding rate of progress. Um, but there are a couple of different directions that I think we could, we could go in here. I mean, one is, I'm curious what you've seen in, in, in your studies in the space um, that suggests to you that the rate of progress is actually slowing. And I'm also curious, um, what are the examples that, that you've seen overall um, of, of how uh, the science around studying progress would potentially lead to um, a, a different approach or a different portfolio of how um, this kind of work gets done. So I don't know where you want to yeah. start with that, here's but there's what, a lot here to do. Here's what worries me, and it should worry you too. So as you mentioned, U.S. life expectancy is basically going up in linear fashion. But if you look at expenditures, we used to spend a few percentage points of GDP on health care, and now it's about 18 percent. So, so we've gone yeah. up to 18 percent, and we're not even boosting the rate. I'm not saying it's the fault of any one group of people. But something has gone wrong. There's some kind of last mile problem. You can turn to the newspapers and read all kinds of fantastic stories, new research, new ideas, new tools. But when the rubber hits the road, people mm -hmm. living longer, we're spending more and more and more for exactly the same returns. So if that trend continues, and you see a similar trend in many areas, also crop yields, feeding the world, other areas, the mm -hmm. question becomes, you know, where does all the progress go? So. The idea that you need to look at each structure and encourage more risk-taking, uh, 
better decisions with the money, less bureaucratization, maybe in some cases more centralization, whatever it takes, but that there is this invisible crisis and people are distracted by the headlines about CRISPR, whatever, but actually what you get for the money Performances, so-so, I think. Yeah, and so what we wrote in this article uh, a year ago uh, uh, about sort of you know what's going on in science. You know, if if you look at it um, uh, by sort of the the most kind of macroscopic measures, right? Like the the number of PhDs in the U.S. like kind of active PhDs has grown by you know or, well, actually you take all the macroscopic measures, they've all grown by about a factor between a fifth of fifty and a hundred, right? Number of PhDs number of papers published every year, just like actual dollars into the science funding and so on. So uh, if, if, you know, in, a, in a, some very stylized way, if we look at sort of the first half of the 20th century as compared to the second half, just like way more kind of input uh, uh, in the second half of, of, of the century. Um, and, uh, and, and again, not by, not by kind of 50%, but by kind of orders of magnitude. And so then I, I think the question for all of us would be, well, uh, you know, in, in which half uh, uh, of the century did, did we get you know, more out in terms of kind of useful scientific knowledge uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, and w whichever we think kind of did better, you know, to what degree, right? Uh, and, you know, again, that's a, that's a very difficult question to answer. You know, how, how do you weigh kind of scientific knowledge? And so you have to kind of look at it, I think, in, in sort of various applied contexts, like life, life, life expect, excuse me, like life expectancy or semiconductors or, as Tyler mentioned, crop yields or, you know, whatever. Um, and I think what's interesting and, and you know, should be concerning is that for almost every conceivable sort of applied measure, we seem to be getting, you know, at best, constant returns. But that's really bad because you know we we've exponentially increasing inputs and we've you know constant return outputs uh, like that 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 is kind of almost by definition sort of not a process that we can sustain. Now you know there's two I think broad possibilities there. One is it's just getting intrinsically harder to to, to generate progress and to kind of discover these things. And you know who knows maybe some significant amount of that is true. But the other possibility is it's somehow more institutional, right? It's more kind of contingent. It's more sociological. Um, and and again we do have suggestive evidence that you know our, our institutions uh, are. Um, well, they're, they're, they're certainly kind of older than they used to be, uh, and they're also kind of, uh, as in the kind of NIH funding example, there are you know changes happening beneath the surface and so on that you know may or may not be good. So I don't think we should write off the possibility that it's actually you know it, it, it's not inevitable, and that there is or that there do exist alternate forms of, of organization where things would work better. And again, if we sort of you know dig a little bit into the the evidence there, you know you, you see things like uh, uh, um, so there's, there's a a science funding program that obviously you're familiar with called HHMI, uh, uh, the, the Howard Hughes kind of medical institute. Um, uh, if uh, they give grants, uh, sort of along the lines of uh, sort of how CCI does, where you know they're they're, they're longer term, uh, they're kind of more open ended, and so on. Uh, Pierre Azale at MIT wrote a paper a couple of years ago, and uh, trying to look at uh, well, if you take you know ostensibly identical scientists who you know some of whom receive HMI grants, some of whom don't, uh, you know how much you know, more successful are the HMI recipients? Uh, and you know he concluded they're about twice as likely to produce a kind of top one percent paper by by citation count. Again, that, that that's really suggestive. They're it, top one percent if they do what? Uh, uh, they're, they're about twice as likely to, to, to produce a top 1% paper by citation count. If right. they, what's uh, oh sorry, sorry, if they receive an HHMI okay. uh, uh, grant. Um, well, that might be correlation, not causation. Yeah, so, so, so he, tr he, he tries <laughs> to control. They do get a lot of the best people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so, so he tries to control for that, and you know, he's a reasonable you know, methodology for it, but, but uh, so, some of it could, could totally be sort of that just you know, selection effect. But again, I think it's very suggestive that, hmm, maybe there are things we could do uh, that would uh, you know, better enable uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of discovery. And you know, th this might seem like sort of a, a bit of a red herring, but I, I think it is kind of, uh, uh, you know, again, suggestive. Uh, that in many other domains where we can objectively assess progress, it's very clear that our productivity has fallen off a cliff uh, and for reasons that we can be pretty sure are not that it's, it's getting intrinsically harder. And so, you know, for example, when New York decided to build the subway in 1900, right, uh, uh, you know, they, they decided to build it. 4.7 years later, they opened 23 subway stations. And in, in 2019 dollars, they spent just over a billion dollars doing so, right? So 23 stations, just over a billion dollars. When New York decided to build the Second Avenue subway uh, in you know, year 2000, uh, uh, 17 years later, they opened three stations. Uh, and they spent four and a half billion dollars doing so, right? Uh, and so kind of uh, our productivity in, um, in, in subway construction has, you know, at least in New York, you know, decreased by a factor of 40. Uh, you know, here in the Bay Area, we decided to build the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the uh, the Bay Bridge, starting in you know 1933. Both projects finished within four years, and then to celebrate it, we decided to build a man-made island, and we built that island in 18 months. Um, and uh, you know, I, 
I, don't, I haven't tried, um, uh, but you know, I would wager that if one tried to build a new island in San Francisco, it would be difficult to do so today. You know, in in, in 18 months, um, and so we, uh, and I mean, California, you know, you have high-speed rail. Where when when you know, France decided to build, uh, you know, the TGV, it's it's it, it's high-speed rail. It opened the first line after five years. Uh, California started pursuing high-speed rail 11 years ago. They mm. forecast, we forecast being finished in 2033. So we project a 25-year project, but of course that's a projection. It'll probably end up being much longer still, right? So, um, you, know, uh, you know, this is a domain where it's hard to imagine that getting or excuse me, the building infrastructure has gotten intrinsically harder, right? Like the, the atoms aren't physically heavier than they used to be, right? Uh, and so clearly there's something institutional, sociological going on with infrastructure. You know, Larry Summers talks about the idea of the sort of, uh, uh, sort of promiscuous distribution of the veto power uh, and just you know how much harder it is to sort of get things done um, you know in as much as that's true then there's the question of well uh, you know have other institutions have other sort of progress generating mechanisms in our society have they also got less efficient uh, and if so you know what can we do about it so as an aside um, if, if you're watching this Patrick collects these examples of, um, <laughs> of, of, of projects, uh, historical projects that went fast and that you can't imagine how, how they went that fast. Um, so you, if, if you Google his website, he has like a, a, whole, a whole list of these that I think is, is, is pretty interesting and compelling when you, when you go through all of them. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just important to understand uh, how effectively we as a, um, as a species how effectively we can do things when we're organized the right way. Humanity is pretty amazing. Uh, and when uh, you know, possibilities are unlocked, when you know, efficacy is enabled, we can do great things. So Sometimes it is a matter of actual will. Mm -hmm. So for the last 40 years, getting around for almost all Americans, it is slower. And before that, we had a period from 1800, say, to 1970, when it got quicker and quicker and quicker. And now even flying in airplanes for most people is slower. Traffic is worse. Those are solvable problems. Manhattan should have congestion pricing and a stiffer form of it than they're likely to opt for. So the notion that people have lost the ability to imagine a future much different and much better than what they know, to me, is one of the most worrying aspects of where we are now. Yeah, and, and this shows up quantitatively. I mean, if you look at sort of the, uh, the percentage of Americans who think that their kids' lives uh, will be you know better than theirs. That has been in sort of monotonic decline. Uh, well, not strictly monotonic, but you know generally declining uh, uh, since World War II. And so, on an empirical basis, Americans are getting less hopeful about you know their futures, their kids' futures, and that's a really bad thing because it can be kind of an auto catalyzing process and a self fulfilling prophecy. And we're supposed to be the most optimistic, forward looking country. The data on France: how many people think their kids will be worse off? That's much more worrying yet. And there may be a self-fulfilling prophecy to this. If you think the future won't be so great, you'll invest less, you won't work as hard, you'll contract your risk-taking, and you end up with a kind of social and economic malaise. And indeed, you see falling rates of economic growth in most of the Western world. So I'm curious how you would think about going about and studying these kind of organizational changes. So going back to biomedical science, for example, just because this is an area that we do a lot of work in. Um, you know, the, the woman who runs our, who runs CCI's science initiative, Corey Bargman, she's a, a, a very renowned scientist, and she has this theory about that a lot of the granting process that NIH does, but also HHMI, it, it, it basically encourages very individualistic work, right? You give people grants, um, they work on their own, you're not incentivizing people to work together. People actually want to work together, they want to coordinate. Yeah. Um, and when I was talking about the Human Cell Atlas, um, you know, a lot of the issue there that needed to get dealt with was, um, you know, a lot of people were working on cell atlases for different parts of the body, okay, the liver cell atlas, the, you know, yeah. whatever. And, but they were all in different data types and, 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 and formats, so that way you couldn't compile a, a holistic thing. So a lot of what she did in, in the work of CCI was basically um, helping to coordinate so that way when these grants were given, everything, like the, the teams worked together, the data types were similar, so that it all added up to a bigger thing. And that certainly seems like one of many theories that one could have for how you could organize this stuff better. But there's this question of how much of progress, um, whether that's something that one could have determined um, just through historical data versus this is the type of thing that you need people or, or the government or foundations to go out and just run different experiments and see, see how this works. And I'm curious how you think about, in terms of studying this, how much of this is like, is history and, and kind of history of science 
um, based on data that's already out there versus we should just try different models of things and, and encourage more creativity and, and, um, and, and, and more competition and try different things. It's striking to me if you look at American universities, the list of the top places in 1920 and the list today is completely the same except we've added on California. Otherwise, no change. Top 50 universities, if you look at... It's very different how, companies. In, of course, even from 1980, it's... Even the Dow is, decade over decade. Yes. The list of the top 10 companies uh, by market cap almost completely turns over. Procedures for tenure in the top 50 research universities, almost exactly the same. Whatever you think of those, there's something gone wrong in the sector. There's not enough experimentation with how you reward people. More schools should experiment with a different kind of tenure or reward people more on the basis of practical impact. And again, you might object to any particular solution, but the extent to which experimentation has died at the institutional level, to me, is striking. And to sort of underscore that point, uh, if you look at the top 25 universities uh, in the world uh, today, or you know, the Times is ranking, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of them, um, uh, seven of the top 25 uh, are American universities that were started in a single 30-year period uh, between 1861 and uh, 1891. Uh, and if you look at, well, where did those universities come from and you know, what were the people behind them thinking, they were very deliberately, sort of specifically reform-minded. Uh, you know, and progress-minded. Uh, absolutely. They, 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 they thought, well, you know, obviously academic institutions exist, you know, Harvard, Yale, and so on were you know, already around, but they saw the success of the, the German sort of research university model. They saw kind of the possibilities of the U.S. and they saw, you know, at least what they thought was kind of required for the future. And, you know, they very deliberately, you know, decided we will try something different. Uh, and again, that yielded what, you know, now uh, seven of the top 25 universities today. Um, so I think it's it kind of strongly, uh, you know, uh, un kind of empirically underscores uh, the value of the kind of experimentation you're, you're, you're talking about. And, you know, fully agree. I think we should be historically informed, but ultimately, uh, you know, a certain amount of sort of commitment, decision, and just willingness to experiment I is going to be required. The other thing I think your, your point about sort of the teams gets at is th there are these really, um, uh, sort of uh, thought-provoking examples of just like productive cultures through history, right? Like if you look at Vienna, uh, 1880 to you know, 1940 or something, you know, you have in so many different fields, uh, uh, you have uh, you know uh, people who did this sort of incredibly formative work. You know, you'd Klimt and you'd uh, Mahler and you'd Mach in physics, and you had of course you know Austrian economics and you know von Mises and Hayek and all the rest, and uh, you'd Freud and you'd Wittgenstein. You know, like uh, Vienna was sort of amazing in this period. And you know, when you kind of dig into the specific stories, you realize a lot of these people knew each other, and 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 they were sort of you know, inspired by each other. They kind of uh, give credit to each other for for you know again across multiple disciplines, uh, sort of uh, you know uh, different parts of their thinking. Or if you look at Edinburgh, uh, so sort of during you know the Scottish uh, uh, Enlightenment. Uh, you know, again, sort of a, t a tiny place. I mean, Edinburgh at the time, say in, in you know, 1780, was was like the size of Santa Cruz, right? Uh, and yet you get, uh, you know, sort of modern economics uh, from Smith. You know, you've, you've Hume. Uh, you have, you know, the birth of modern geology. Uh, you know, amazing literature, poetry, and so on. Uh, and uh, and so clearly there was something, you know extant in Edinburgh in 1780 that was you know, not there in Dublin in 1780. Uh, and I think, it, it, you know, obviously it's hard to pin down, like, what was that? But at the same time, you know, the, the difficulty in defining it doesn't mean it wasn't there or it's not important. I would say this. I'm sitting here with two university dropouts. That's notable to me. The Bay Area is our modern Vienna, you know, bravo to the Bay Area. But we're not working nearly hard enough to build other new Viennas and other places. And I don't really think it's quite Manhattan anymore. It's a wonderful city, an amazing place to go. But it is not a world leader for ideas in the way it was, say, the 1920s through the 1980s. So people study this, right? I mean, so what, I mean, what have been the main things that people have learned so far from studying Vienna or Edinburgh? Um, well, I don't think there's a rich literature of lessons from those places. Obviously, lots has been written about them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're, they're you know, great historical accounts. I've, I've enjoyed reading them. Uh, but I, I mean, it, it, well, it's an intrinsically very difficult thing to do to figure out, well, you know, which things causally mattered. You know, the, the, and, and these things, you know, there's a certain degree to which they might be kind of, um, you know, overdetermined. Uh, and uh, so it, I think it's very hard to, you know, you don't have counterfactuals. Uh, obviously, you can't run trials. And so I think it is a very difficult question to answer. Mm. Uh, and 
I think you know, for understandable reasons, uh, people studying these questions are reluctant to you know, take definitive stances that you know, this is what mattered uh, in, in 1900 Vienna. But one um, lesson I would say, the Scottish islands, people moved to Edinburgh, right? Uh, Vienna, you have Jews coming in from the Pale of Settlement. The Bay Area, people coming from all over the world. And indeed, you're from Ireland. So immigration, immigration is not a guarantee of things going well. But the bringing together of different ideas and cultures and the new clash of opposing perspectives has been correlated with a lot of these Viennas in the, the yeah. world history. Very true, although I'm pretty sure that in 1900, uh, Paris had more foreigners than Vienna. Like, I think it was like 2% in Vienna, so uh, hey, I, I, well, I, I very much agree with the point. If you go from the Scottish right. islands to Edinburgh <laughs> yes, that, that in 1740, right. that's a huge difference. It's a bigger difference maybe than you know, Mexico to Los Angeles today. Andrew, so if, if you're thinking about what kind of work to fund in terms of, of studying historical progress, what's your framework for figuring out where to even begin studying? Because, I mean, what you're, what you're talking about here is, um, is basically studying the economic and, and scientific um, result of immigration, which is obviously a massively socially important debate that's you know, at the center of a lot of political debates and has been for a long time. So, um, you know, from one perspective, it would be very, it's, it's sort of surprising that it wouldn't have been studied in, in more detail to, to understand um, the, the impact of it. Um, but that's very different from kind of the biomedical science type stuff that we were talking about a second ago. Um, do you have a framework in your head for how you um, would, would think about or prioritizing studying in different areas? Or is it mostly just about finding really sharp people who um, have new ideas and, and funding them to do different kinds of work? Or how, how do you think about that overall? Pe people who are curious, people who have bold ambitions, people who have what I call stamina. They just don't ever stop. Uh, people who are working in productive small groups, that may be through WhatsApp, in fact, or it could be their next door neighbors, their colleagues at a university. When those, say, four items come together, then I think you have possibly what is a very good funding decision, and I would take a lot of chances on those people. Not worry too much about the micromanaging and let talent rip and let groups form and see what happens. Got it. So it's... it's very much like entrepreneurship in that way. You're betting on the person more than But also the, the vision, right? There has to be a vision. And there are plenty of successful entrepreneurs who are not curious. So for intellectual progress, to, to really put curiosity very highly is part of my philosophy. Hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, you know, it, it, I want to be kind of um, careful here. We're, we're, you know, on the one hand, uh, not only sort of do we acknowledge that an immense amount of you know, very important, insightful work you know, has already, um, you know, being created, uh, and you know, it, it's that work that, to a large degree, has I think inspired you know bo both of our viewpoints. Um, uh, in that, you know, for example, uh, uh, the, the paper sort of Tyler mentioned about um, you know d declining research productivity in uh, in semiconductors, crop yields, and you know a couple of other fields that was done fairly close to here. And you know that is work squarely relevant to these questions that that I think is is you know, really important, and we may not be here in the same way without it. On the other hand, it is simultaneously true that major um, sways of these questions really are surprisingly underinvestigated. And so, again, just to, to return to biomedical funding and, and the NIH, um, as far as I can tell, there, there are no books uh, assessing how well is the NIH working. And I don't have a strong view on on the answer to that question, but I, I do have a strong view on the importance of knowing uh, and which parts of the NIH are working better and worse. And in as much as the NIH has changed over the last couple of decades, was the old NIH better or the new one? Like, th this stuff is so important. And so while it's the case that there's a huge amount of good research happening today with you know, fantastic researchers, in a sense, there aren't enough of them. Uh, and a lot of the central questions are still unanswered. Yeah, interesting. Do you think, so you were talking a minute ago about the explosion in costs in healthcare. And, uh, and right now, I think one of the defining aspects of, of the moment that we're in is a lot of the basic costs of living for a lot of people are, have just increased a lot. Right? We're, you know, the, the, the story that we tell about our society is that okay, you have technology and you have competition and it drives down prices. Um, so you know, if, you, if you bought um, a TV today, if you, if you bought a TV from you know, a 10-year-old TV today, it would cost you know, a 5% of what it cost 10 years ago. Um, so clearly the value and, and, and efficiency has increased a lot uh, there. 
but then in things that matter so much, like healthcare, um, education, uh, rent, um, those things have, have generally just increased, right? And in and, and like the, the normal dynamics that you would be hoping would play out um, aren't. And to some degree, for the quality of life for a lot of people, the increases in those costs um, may even be dwarfing Absolutely. all the other advances sure. and everything Absolutely. else. Absolutely. So do you think that that is, that those things are all related? Or, or do you think, I mean, I, I think you use the phrase cost disease, right? When, right. when, um, when referring to, you know, the, the cost explosion of things like healthcare and education, um, student debt, uh, and, and rent. Um, do you think that that's a different type of problem? Or do you think that that is fundamentally related to um, the rate of progress in, um, in biomedicine, as an example? I think there are common features to these problems, though each one is different. Restrictions on entry is one. Highly bureaucratized institutions, sometimes a lot of third-party payment, which may be required in the case of catastrophic health care, but it nonetheless has distorting effects. Areas where people have very strong moral feelings, I think we often make worse decisions about. Uh, we're not analytical enough. And you put all of those together, but I would stress, say, healthcare. If you go to Singapore, healthcare there, I think it's about 4% of GDP. They have slightly higher life expectancy than we do. Their system is by no means perfect. Uh, but we can see through comparative analysis, there are ways of doing this better. The NIMBY problem, cost of living, getting an apartment in Japan, it is mostly solved because building in Japan tends to be regulated at higher levels than the city or the county, so more gets built. Living in Japan is cheaper, the cost of renting an apartment. So often we kind of know the answers. We, we shy away from really focusing on a concerted effort to get to doing them in this country. Yeah, and I uh, agree with all of that. And I, I would just underscore the, the entry costs aspect. And the entry costs aren't always, or, or they, I think, uh, take different forms, right? And that sort of empirically, the entry costs of forming a new university uh, are really high, but that, that's not because you know, there, there's a kind of formal toll you have to pay. It's, 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 not, it's not like zoning where there are kind of deliberate, specific uh, kind of uh, legal restrictions that you know, prohibit you from doing so. Um, but, but just as a practical matter, you know, sociologically, institutionally, accreditation dynamics, who knows, it, it's apparently almost impossibly difficult to create a, a successful new university today. And so I, uh, I, I think sort of, well, I think answering the cost disease question is uh, one of the most important sort of subcomponents in, in, in you know, this broader question of you know, what is it that enables our progress. And uh, over, at an overarching level, it's just surprising to me that we don't have sort of more definitive um, and, uh, and clear answers there. Uh, Alex Tabarak, a, a colleague of Tyler. Wrote a long paper uh, on the uh, cost uh, disease. Exactly, last summer. Um, and, and you know, there are other, papers, uh, uh, you know, analyzing the, the uh, also analyzing the question, but it's a surprisingly sparse literature. Uh, you know, uh, Alex's list of citations was not that long. Uh, and, you know, he, he had some suggestions as to, you know, what the underlying etiology might be. Um, you know, maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, but again, that, that's, it's, to your point, it's one of the most pressing questions, uh, you know, for American society, for global society in 2019. Um, we really have to know what's happening. And, and you know, to return to something Tyler said earlier, uh, part of our hope, you know, it's not to kind of promote any specific solution, any specific, um, I don't know, uh, aspect of it, but rather that, you know, even though this is not what's kind of focally central in the headlines today, it should be. Um, and as we think of what the world is going to look like in 50 years or in 100 years, it plausibly more than anything else is going to determine the shape of that. As an entrepreneur, what is it you find most striking about America's dysfunctional economic sectors? Because you intersect with them all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I would want to see this get studied more. But um, so it, there are just so many different factors. And I think part of what is, is a little bit confusing is that the things that are making healthcare so expensive, they may have some fundamental link to the things that make um, college tuition so expensive, but um, but on its surface, it seems like there there are also more proximate causes that are quite different. So, um, you know, I mean, so with with college tuition, the fact that okay, it's really expensive, so then we do more um, to subsidize the cost of it, and then by doing so, we're not providing any pressure on colleges to 
uh, to make it more efficient, and then the cost just goes up further, is a pretty different dynamic than, um, than what's going on with healthcare, where, um, where basically Americans want to know that you know, if someone in their family gets sick, they're going to be able to get every treatment possible, um, in order, in which, which ends up, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've seen all, all the stats on this, that you know, half of the healthcare costs that someone incurs are in the last six months of their life. Um, and that's, I guess, part of what you're saying is an American moral value, which is that um, you know, we believe that you should do everything you can to, to help someone who's sick, whereas in a lot of other countries, um, I, I don't know what Singapore's situation is, but a lot of the ones that are often cited as more efficient healthcare systems um, don't have that approach. They, they say, okay, okay, if, if, if someone in your family has um, this form of cancer, um, we'll do these two treatments, and then we're done. And you know, part of that is because they may not be able to incur the level of, um, of debt as a country that the U.S. can. Um, so they may just have to make that trade-off. But it, it creates all these downstream dynamics where, okay, now if, if you as a society are willing to say, um, okay, we're going to have two treatments for, for this kind of cancer and not, do, not try all seven things, then now you know, France can go, for example, negotiate with the drug companies and say, all right, I'm only going to support the two that are the most cost effective and the other ones are out to dry, whereas in the American system, um, you, know, you don't have that kind of negotiating leverage. So it seems like they're very different things. Um, but I, I kind of, intuitively, it seems like at their root, there should be some commonalities. Um, and I would be very interested to, to kind of to understand that in more detail. I'm, I'm curious why, you know, from, from what you're saying about okay, so that the literature is sparse. Um, well, on, on cot disease in particular. Yeah, wh why do you think more people aren't studying this? I mean, given that this is just such a central thing in the lives of most people, right? It's, I mean, the cost of living in cities um, has gone up so much. We have a whole generation of students. I think the, the total student debt is now um, almost $2 trillion, right? I think it was 1.7, the last stat that I saw. And of course, healthcare is, is, um, is, is just, um, you know, the number of people in the country who are within you know, uh, one issue of being right. bankrupt yes. um, is, is just kind of staggering. So well, what, what, what's, what's preventing academia, people from studying this? I wouldn't say anything's preventing them. The incentive is to build a brick and to build a brick that can survive scrutiny by referees. The incentive is not to build a building in most cases. Biomedicine actually is often different, uh, but in the social sciences. So there's so many bricks out there. And so people want to say, oh, we're already studying this. It's correct, the bricks are there in the millions. Uh, but the bricks and the buildings are a different thing. But I have a question for you, if I may be allowed. Go for it. What is it you would most like to see from academics? And I, I don't mean research on social media. I mean America, the world. W w what do you want? Although I would like more research course, on social absolutely. media. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> That's fun. <clears throat> no, look, I, I think that the, these issues on exploding costs and why these systems aren't, um, aren't working the way that they're supposed to for people is probably one of the most pressing questions. I mean, when I think about um, you know, our work over the next decade, and it's like, what are we going to do that's going to fundamentally make people's lives better? Um, there's a lot that we can do. But, it's, it, but if these problems continue at the rate that they're going at, it's actually quite hard for me to imagine how we could do enough good to overcome the increase in costs that people are incurring at things that are so fundamental. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working on them in, in, in kind of in somewhat different ways, right? I think healthcare is difficult because it is so inherently political for the, because it touches on moral values, right? If you, if you want to have a difference in approach of how we treat the last six months of people's lives, that's something that's more of a democratic question than a, than a technocratic one, I think. Um, people need to be able to support that. Um, so I, I don't personally feel like that's an area that, I, that I'm going to have a huge impact. A lot of people are focused on that. But the area that I do think we can make a big impact is on long-term science research. So if you can just make it more efficient to cure, prevent, or manage diseases, then that over the long term should really be the answer for bringing healthcare costs in line. Not in the next 10 years, but maybe um, in over the next 50 years. Um, I'd like to see a solution before that. So I'd, I'd love to see more studying of, of the healthcare part of this. But on the science side, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about that. On housing, I don't know. I mean, it's um, you know, th there's always the question of of what, which forces in technology end up being stronger than, you know, like which trends end up being stronger. So, you know, on the one hand, you have um, this giant mismatch of opportunity where people feel compelled to move to cities, 
uh, because that's kind of where a lot of the jobs are. But then there's not enough building of supply of housing, so rent just increases. And then that means that even though people are going and doing higher value things, their lives actually aren't benefiting as much from that because so much of their costs are just of, of the value that they're generating is just going to housing because rent is, is getting so high. Um, so, I mean, what, historically, what have people done? I mean, it, we invented cars, right, and, and um, freeways. That way people could live further out. You know, I mean, maybe, um, you know, maybe something like the Hyperloop could extend suburbs like five times as far. So, you know, that could make it so someone could live quite further away. Um, and that, 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 that would be good, right, if you can increase the effective radius of a city. Um, that's one way to alleviate constraints, political constraints or, or um, concerns about people building things. So that way you can get more supply, bring the cost down. But you know, I, I happen to have a more, uh, I happen to think a different thing is probably the right solution. Um, you know, in 2019, it's a lot easier to move bits around than it is atoms. So rather than people moving, inventing a new Hyperloop or, or cars, um, I tend to think that the set of technologies um, around whether it's augmented reality or virtual reality or video presence that just let people be where they want to be physically and feel present with other people wherever they, they need to be to, to do their job, to um, connect with the people they, they, they care about. Um, that feels to me like the better long-term solution. Don't make everyone move to cities. Um, make it so people can choose where they want to be and can get access to all the opportunities they want everyone. So those are kind of, I, it's hard for me to imagine um, more important problems, at least over the next um, for the pressing problems for the next decade. I think over the longer term, um, you, you know, potentially climate change is, is, is more of an existential issue. But, but in terms of people's lives today, I think the exploding costs from, um, from these areas is such a profound issue. And the trend is so uh, Pat, like, yeah. out of control. Well, 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 just three, quick, three quick points on that. Um, one is, um, uh, I think these questions are, are often a little bit, uh, like the cost of these questions, I think one of the reasons it, it's kind of difficult to study is because you sort of have to take this very macroscopic and potentially this very microscopic view. And so say, for example, in science, uh, if it were the case that the administrative burden on scientists had increased by, say, two thirds uh, over the last 40 years, I'm not saying it has, and not, and not saying that even if, if it has, that, that is in fact the cause of any kind of slowdown, but you know, if it had, that might be quite difficult to observe because it, you know, it could, could come in the form of, well, that, you know, the, um, uh, it takes you know, twice as long on average for things to be approved and the forms are kind of longer and you're interrupted more. Mm -hmm. And so like actually specifically diagnosing the kind of causal pathways I think can, can really be quite tricky. And I think that generalizes a lot of the fields. Um, Secondly, uh, to your point uh, about sort of uh, technology potentially solving the agglomeration kind of imperative of cities, I think that could be true. Although you know, here we are in person. You know, uh, uh, is, uh, but others but, but, are watching. But, yeah, but the people true. are watching yeah. everywhere else. Fair, fair. In the uh, past that. Very fair. Um, uh, but you know, even if technology solves that, uh, I guess my worry would be that the uh, sort of the socio-institutional dynamics that have uh, kind of ruined cities or, or made them less effective or whatever, um, uh, probably also uh, generalize and apply to other domains uh, and. and so we're going to suffer the cost of those same phenomena uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And what do you want to ask, Mark? Hmm. Um, well, um, how, uh, I guess, what have you learned from doing CCI uh, in that, you know, how, um, I mean, you, you launched it five years ago? Um, four years ago. Okay, yeah. Um, how will the next four years be different to the first four? Well, so one of the things that we struggle with here is um, these are such long-term projects, right? So we're, we're, we talked a lot about the scientific research. Um, you know, we're also doing a, a bunch of work with education to build um, tools for teachers to do more um, project-based learning, more personalized learning for, for kids, but um, basically make it so that um, teachers have, have tools to do the work that they want to do, mentor students. Um, and, and not you know just have to have to lecture and have everyone learn at the same pace. Um, so this stuff, it's we're making progress in all of these areas. And I think one of the meta questions in running CCI is um, at what point to check in and consider evolving the direction. I mean, obviously there's there's minor execution things that you try to improve along the way, um, but. Um, but I want to make sure that we have an awareness that these are fundamentally problems that we're going to be working on for 10 or 20 years um, and not 
I think a lot of these things, just kind of a consistency of approach and um, in, in building trust is, is kind of um, you know, more important than constantly evaluating or potentially thrashing. In science, we've had the benefit of, um, of taking on a number of different projects, right? So the Human Cell Atlas was one of the original ones. Now, uh, one of the next areas that we're really excited to work on is imaging. Um, you know, there's a lot of advances in microscopy, um, but there are a lot of things that we still can't see. Um, you know, and, and as engineers, I think one of the things that um, you, you can probably appreciate is, you know, just um, you, you, when you're trying to debug a system, you really want to like get into the code and see, you step through it and see where the thing is breaking down. But you know, we don't really have a way today to see um, a white blood cell eat a, a, a you know a virus, right? It's like to see, like to see, like in in vivo, right? Like in in, in the body, um, to see proteins folding live. Um, and I think that you know there are certain optical levels, on, uh, optical thresholds on the physics that you might not be able to get beyond. But um, but between that and the advances in AI, I, I do think that it's possible to um, give scientists new imaging capacity um, that hasn't been possible before. So a lot of what we're trying to do is, all right, so the Human Cell Atlas, we took an approach that was kind of very broad and, um, and, and collaborative and, um, and, and somewhat chaotic even in, in, in a way. And I think we were able to learn some of the lessons from that as we're now thinking about how we organize um, the, the imaging project about, okay, maybe it would be helpful to have more clearly established leadership um, around it uh, up front. Um, you know, maybe there are things that, uh, you know, that rather than having just one, yeah. one big project, there are going to be areas where we can just build tools that, that go into every lab. Right. Um, there's one software package called Napari that, that um, you know, a lot of scientists, it's like, like, a lot, like right now there's, the, the actual technology of microscopes is, um, is kind of uh, ahead of scientists' ability to process the data. So there's this weird mismatch because you know, it kind of makes sense if you're, you know, the NIH funding supports people to to ha um, to basically have a lab. Yeah, t um, tool building is not really you know subsidized or supported that well. Yeah, but I mean, if you want to have a team of ongoing software engineers, right. that's like okay, you, you're going to want an effort that's going on for a while. Um, that's more than a couple of people. Yep. Um, so that kind of thing, I think. There's a real niche that no one is 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 doing that stuff at the scale that it needs to get done. So, um, so just pushing on both of those. Yeah, and, and, and there's uniform agreement on on that particular point from almost every biomedical scientist that I speak with. Like tool yeah. building is undersupported. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I'm uh, from a meta point. I'm, I'm a little wary of concluding whether that things have like which things have worked and not worked well yet. Um, I mean, certainly not everything we're going to do is going to work. I no, mean, that's it's, like it's, it's four years. It's too early to say. Yeah, but like, but um, but it's certainly interesting. And I mean, what I try to push the teams to do is make sure that the work that we're doing are things that clearly would not have happened otherwise. Right. right. right I think, especially in a lot of these fields, and in philanthropy, I think that there are a lot of potential issues with this, where it's easy to um, to give money to something and feel like you're doing good because you probably are doing some good, but, but, the but then lack the discipline to, to say, yeah. okay, am I doing the most good that I can, right? right. And, and I think um, we kind of have a responsibility to, to, yeah. to do that. Um, so that's the thing that I push our team to do is develop really different theories. Um, I'm quite confident that in education, um, the work that we're doing is just stuff that, that if we weren't trying it, um, I, I don't. I, it's not clear that like anyone else would be doing a, a, an effort like this at scale. Um, I feel really good about that. I think in imaging, um, something like that is going to be similar. Even in, in social advocacy, um, we're doing a lot of work in criminal justice reform. That's you know a combination of um, advocacy and building tools for accountability and, and working with um, reform-minded prosecutors that they can be more data-driven about who they try to bring charges against because, I mean, they want to be fair, you know, or at least a, a lot of folks want to be fair and they don't have um, the data to either optimize how they, they run their office or to hold um, the people in there accountable. So building those kind of tools can be um, super helpful and I'm quite confident that if we weren't pushing on that, I'm not... Um, and I feel good that that's like a good theory to to at least try to push on. So that's what we try to do in in in, in the work in the work. Say over like there. the criminal justice work, education, biomedical. What's the underlying view or insight or experience of yours that's the common element behind those areas? Like how do we boil down Mark Zuckerberg philanthropy to a smaller number of dimensions? 
Well, first of all, it's not just me. I do it with my wife. So, um, sorry, so she yeah, actually is. Well, yes. no. Well, she's an important element to this because she was a teacher. Um, actually, she is a teacher. She, she's building a school. I mean, she she spends a lot of time over there. She um, is a doctor. So, um, so if you so if you're looking at the education and and, and health aspects, um, the domain expertise is more hers than mine. Um, and 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 she is quite, uh, I think, compelling and, and insightful on. On, um, on, on some of the things that need to get done there. In terms of the approach, um, that may be more inspired by me in some ways where, um, where you know, it's the very long-term focus, which I think it comes from a lot of the lessons I've learned from Facebook. Um, it's the tool building, which um, comes from um, having the experience building engineering teams. Um, and it's some of, the, 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 some of what we've learned just in in kind of managing and, and partnering with folks through through building the company is that it's it's a lot of what you said. It's like you want to bet on the best individuals um, in in different spaces and and, and give them room to run. Um, and in managing complex projects, you need to know when um, something needs to be a little more directive versus when you want it to um, just be an open thing that can make progress in a more chaotic way. And that might be more art than science, or at least until your your field gets um, <laughs> fully solves all these questions. But it's a, um, but yeah, it's a, I don't know. It's an interesting set of of, of questions, and you know, I mean, certainly the, um, you know, I guess one one animating theme certainly is, you know, as our kids grow up, we want to make sure that they live better lives. So it's um, so these aren't things that are primarily going to benefit us. Right, it's. I mean, you know, if if you're trying to benefit us, we wouldn't be working on education. I think the the um the the health um, work is uh, very long term oriented. If we were focused on kind of our own health, you know, you'd be we'd probably be doing more um, disease specific work rather than fundamental science to try to or tool building for fundamental science, which might even be a level um, more abstract than fundamental science to try to compound the rate of progress in science. Um, and then a lot of work on equality and making sure, you know, the, the criminal justice work, I think, is, I mean, a, a lot of, you know, the way that our, our country handles this stuff is just such an unfortunate outlier compared to um, other countries and the amount of human capital that is locked a, away um, is, um, you know, is its, its, its own thing that, that I think deserves, I mean, a, a lot more than studying. But, I mean, certainly I think just Im improving that would be, would be a, big, um, a, a big advance. Um, but I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, th this conversation is interesting because it's. I think it highlights somewhat of a of a distinction in in um, in uh, you know. I guess my approach to learning or studying these things is more the um, try different things and experiment and kind of and then play it forward, generate new data that doesn't exist, and and see how that goes. Um, and you know, talking to you and 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 seeing the work that. That you do, and I guess this is probably intrinsic to being an academic too, um, where more of the work is 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 about um, you know looking at data sets that can exist and and studying what is already there rather than trying to kind of create the new data sets or approaches. Um, it's I mean it, there there are two approaches that I think complement each other, but are um, but are actually quite different in terms of of how you you kind of approach learning about how to how to do the best work going forward. Well, I think. Um, uh... I think there is a very important to emphasize sort of complementarity, uh, where you know, for any of these kind of really important questions about sort of you know how should science be organized or which kinds of policies generate the most economic growth or how one should support the diffusion of innovation or whatever, I don't think there exists kind of definitive data on that question. I, I don't think by sort of you know just going deep in the literature you're going to come up with sort of clear answers that you know one can feel confident in, in going and executing it or implementing. I, I think of the the data such as it exists and um, uh, and the existing findings as as kind of you know, uh, food for hypothesis generation, uh, and you know, yeah. f f for example, you know, to, to, to kind of return to the the, the management yeah, training that's right. that's one, right. like. Uh, I would probably not have guessed the effect sizes would be that large, right? Uh, and so, kind of, if those studies hadn't been conducted, I don't think you know I would have um, uh, you know ascribed sort of particular you know. Um, uh, uh, sufficient expe ex excuse me, expectation value uh, to the effort of maybe you know Stripe going and doing something there. But now because of those studies, I think well, you know, per per perhaps there are on the margins things we could do. M maybe there are things that end up being sort of quite materially valuable over time. And so I, I, I think being able to sort of marshal those, 
uh, you know, potentially being able to sort of encourage people to dig more sort of in, in sort of particular directions, and then to co you know uh, uh, combine that with a willingness to experiment uh, and a willingness to you know, frankly, just be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think kind of the synthesis, synthesis of that um, is, is really powerful. And, and again, if you you go back and you look at the um, the, the foundations that I think have have you know, really had. Uh, significant impact uh, uh, over the, you know, the the past 100, 200 years. I think it's that kind of combination. Uh, in that, you know, if you look at um, uh, like Warren Weaver, who is the guy who is at Rockefeller, who who funded Norman Borlaug, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he he'd worked with Vannevar Bush at OSRD during World War II. Uh, he um, uh, I think he'd he he was familiar with um, a lot of the Data and just kind of empirical realities of you know how different kinds of scientific and you know technological ventures were likely to work, but he was also willing to just place a bold bet and that you know uh, um, uh, pursue the hypothesis that agronomy could be radically improved. But you know there was no particularly strong basis you know ex ante to to, to really have conviction in that. And so I think it's all in the combination. Yeah, interesting. So I mean I'm, I'm curious to push. Further on one one question that was, I mean, you asked me what I would what I would want sure. people to be studying. Why don't you think people are studying the the um, the cost questions as much as um, as it seems like they should be, or it seems like it's, it, if these are as big of questions for society, and it certainly seems like they're issues that most people have. Um, what are what are the structural barriers that are preventing the top people? In these fields, from um, from deciding to go study it, is is it that the fields don't line up with it? Is that there's not funding for it? Is it too hard in certain ways? Like what what are what are the dynamics that are that are going on here? There are many big questions. It's hard to study them. So at the end, you have quite a speculative answer or set of hypotheses. So the world as a whole isn't sure what to make of that. Is it a real contribution? So the private return to you as a researcher maybe is unclear. So you tend to get very famous people who are quite well established looking at really big ideas maybe a bit later in their career. And I'm not saying that's bad work, but it's not necessarily cutting edge either. And they've spent their whole lives being famous, and they're not necessarily in a position to actually make the breakthrough. And then younger people, their incentive is to first get established and do something that is quite defensible. So I think in general, big questions are understudied. Uh, the tenure system, I think, increasingly is broken. Uh, a lot of academics do work pretty hard but that so much of your audience is a narrowly defined set of peers who write you reference and tenure letters. I think yeah. we need to change. And the incentive for academics to integrate with practitioners and learn from them and actually try doing things, uh, we need more of that. I've often suggested for graduate school, instead of taking a class, everyone should be sent to a not so high income village for two weeks. They can do whatever they want. Just go for two weeks, think about things. Uh, no one wants to do this. No one wants to experiment with it. People who do development often do it on their own, but the notion that every economist should have studied the East Asian economic miracle, the Industrial Revolution, and spent two weeks or more in a poor village, it's just not how things are, and I'd like to change that. So how, do, how does one go about changing that? So if you're trying to create a network of people who, who feel like they have an incentive to study this because it's going to be good for their career, Right, and it's not, and, and they're gonna. They have a network of supportive people who um, might be reviewing the the grants or, or the, the work that they're doing, and and also think that this is important work to be done. How do you how do you go about establishing that? I can selfishly cite that at George Mason, virtually all of our students have very directly studied these questions, and we funded a lot of them to go live other distant, strange, possibly poor places. Uh, other departments may have more money than we do. It can be done because we've done it at George Mason. So I think, again, it's a question of the will and just the ability and desire to imagine that things could be quite different in a sense that I think was more common in the America, say, of 1958 or JFK's decision to put a man on the moon than you see actually in 2019. Hmm. All right. Is that a good place to, to wrap? Fine by me. All right. Well, thank you, guys. This has been a great conversation. Thank you.